it is. Good afternoon. My name is Phil Greenwald. I'm the uh, Transportation Planning Manager with the City of Longmont. I represent Boulder County as well with the TAC. I'm filling in today for Sarah, who is um, out with some uh, other issues. So as Vice Chair, I'll uh, try to run this Transportation Advisory Committee the best I can here. So um, I call to order the August 28th, 2023 Dr. Cog TAC meeting at 1.30. In this in-person live stream meeting format, members of the public attending by Zoom have the ability to mute and unmute themselves and share their webcam. Those attending online, please make sure that your typed name reflects your first and last name and your representation. We ask that those attending or those intending to speak use their raise hand button to ask a question or a comment on an agenda item. If you have any technical questions, you can direct those to staff in the chat box. Again, please use the raise hand feature to ask any questions or comment on an agenda item. Reminder, during the business agenda, TAC members and alternates can speak or ask questions. Members of the public may speak during public comments only. As a reminder to those members and alternates here in person, please press the unmute button on the bottom of your mic stand. And I always get confused because it's always like the red button by the little mic. Um, push that to uh, and make sure the light on your microphone is on when you are prepared to speak and please speak directly into the microphone as your voice will amplify. Please announce your name and representation when asking a question or making a comment for the record as we have many new faces, or a few new faces today at least. Dr. Cog is sending around the sign-in sheet. Please sign in. At this time, TAC members and alternates in person will introduce themselves and we'll start over here to my left. And the mic. Marissa Gahan, CDOT, um, DTD. Jim Eusen, Region 4, uh, CDOT. Jim Kotz, Arapahoe County Transportation Division Manager. Matt Callison, City of Aurora. David Kretzinger, City of Denver, sitting in for Jen Hillhouse. Justin Bagley, City County, Denver. Bill Soroy, RTD. Carson Priest, TDM Non-Motorized. Sarah Duesenberry, City of North Glen. Lauren Kurgis, Dr. Cog Staff. Josh Schwank, Dr. Cog Staff. Brody Ayers, Aviation Special Interest. David Gasper, City and County of Denver. Alex Hyderite, Boulder County. Christina Lane, Jefferson County. Mike Whitaker, City of Lakewood. Brent Sutherland, City of Littleton. Chris Hudson, South Parker. Larry Nimmo, City of Castle Pines. Wally Wirt, Freight Special Interest Chair. Uh, Justin Schmidt, City of Lone Tree, representing Douglas County. Kelly Van Bregen, City of Arvetta, in for Sean Poe. John Ferruzzi, City of Arvetta. Jeff Boyd, Two Creeks Neighborhood. Housing C. Hi, Frank Bruno, Via Mobility Services. Art Griffith, Douglas County. Jessica Mickelbust, CDOT, Region 1. Pam Kennedy, Dr. Cox Staff. Jacob, Jacob Rieger, Dr. Cox Staff. Ron Papsdorf, Dr. Cox. Hey, thanks. Are there any people in the back, any alternates in the back I'm supposed to ask? Jonathan Webster, City of and County of Denver. Okay. We do have some introductions of some new members at this time, so I'll turn it over to Jacob for that. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, so just a couple uh, membership announcements. Um, I don't think Janet Lundquist is here, but want to welcome Janet Lundquist as the new um, temporary representative for Adams County, replacing Chris Chobin. And then I think uh, listening online is Carrie Erickson. Um, she is Hillary Simmons' alternate um, and um, it's covering for Hillary for a couple months. So welcome to you both. Thank you, Jacob. I will now take or open the meeting for public comment. Public comment is limited to three minutes. 
Um, as a reminder, after the public comment period, only TAC members and alternates will partake in the discussion regarding each agenda item. If joined by Zoom, please raise your hand by pressing the raise hand button and we will call on you to begin speaking. Joined by phone, please raise your virtual hand by pressing star nine and we will call on you by the last three digits of your phone number. Staff will unmute you and you will need to unmute yourself by pressing star six on your phone. You have three minutes to speak after which we will ask you to wrap up and your line will be muted. As a reminder to everyone after the public comment period, only TAC members and alternates will partake in the discussion regarding an item. Is there anybody online? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I don't see any hands raised at this time. I'm going to give it a second to see if any doesn't look like that. Great. Thank you very much. Is there anybody behind me that would like to speak publicly? If so, please raise your hand. Seeing anyone. Okay. With that, public invited or public comments closed, and we'll move on to the um, meeting summary from the July 24th, 2023 TAC. Is there any discussion, corrections, or questions about the July 24th meeting? Uh, Mr. Chair, there, we do have one quick correction. Matt Williams was listed as uh, attending virtually. He attended in person. So just wanted to get that on the record. Thank you. And also see Member McSroy. Uh, <laughs> yes, uh, my name is spelled wrong on the, on the, on the <laughs> meeting minutes. That's the first time ever, right? Okay. On? Yep. Uh, apologies to Bill for. I'm. I'm sorry. I didn't catch that. Um, the, just by way of quick explanation for what Cam said about Matt Williams, um, as most of you will recall, with the adjustments to the membership of TAC, we now have sort of slates of alternatives for each of the counties, not sort of an alternative for not an al as opposed to an alternate for each member. So we'll get we'll get better at tracking that for future meetings and future. Great, and with those corrections, any other corrections to the agenda from or from the meeting summary from last month? Not those <laughs> summary stands with the corrections that we stated. So we'll move forward into informational briefings. So our first informational briefing is the Regional Transportation Demand Management Strategic Plan. It's attachment B in your packet. And Kaylee Fallon, our Emerging Mobility and TDM Planner, will be introducing that topic. So, hello. Oh, perfect. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kaylee Fallon. I am the Emerging Mobility and TDM Planner here at Dr. Cog. And today, going to give a quick update on the Transportation Demand Management Strategic Plan. Um, we'll really do a quick recap to make sure we're kind of all on the same page and level set on the purpose and goals of the plan. Um, and then we'll launch into a high-level overview of the draft um, recommendations and the draft toolkit strategies, um, and then we'll take a look at next steps. But really planning to use the majority of my presentation time today to open the floor up for discussions, questions, um, concerns that you all may have on the draft recommendations and the draft toolkit. Um, so just a quick refresher um, for those of you who may be new. Um, the kind of purpose of the regional TDM strategic plan and why we're doing this. Um, it was identified in Dr. Cog's 2022-2023 UPWP, um, really just supports TDM and mobility services in our region. Um, long story short, it is an overhaul to Dr. Cog's short-range TDM plan, which was published in 2012, so over a decade ago. Um, so really looking to kind of refresh um, what TDM means to Dr. Cog and our region. Um, quick overview of the scope of work outline. Um, that task one is ongoing, but we have completed task two and three. So we are currently at task four and five. Again, that's the TDM toolkit, as well as the recommendations and plan preparation, what we'll focus uh, most of this presentation on. 
Here is a, a timeline of our remaining plan process. So um, as you can see, we're currently in August and September. Um, we're getting ready for public comment period. And then we will be bringing um, the plan back to you all in November um, and then aiming to bring the plan to RTC and board approval in December. Okay, great. So um, what we have done in terms of stakeholder engagement thus far, um, we've had five workshops completed with that stakeholder steering committee. Again, these are the folks that are engaged in TDM day in and day out on their days. Um, that's including our TMA partners, CDOT, RTD, um, and then we also have that regional TDM consortium. Um, so these are the folks that maybe um, don't deal with TDM every day in their role, but are certainly adjacent to TDM. Um, and we've had two overlapping workshops with those folks. Um, we have completed our focus groups. Um, and so you'll see on the screen here, we had about seven focus groups ranging from equity to large employers, land use, bids, mobility operators, and TMAs. And then we also hosted um, separate workshops with both CDOT and the TMAs to kind of vet um, the draft strategic recommendations as well as the toolkit strategies. Okay, so launching into the draft recommendations. Um, just a quick overview of the process and how the draft recommendations came about. Um, they were developed through those stakeholder steering committee workshops that I just mentioned, um, as well as those focus groups. They were also um, developed through a, an internal Dr. Cog staff workshop hosted um, with our consultant. Um, and then our consultant also did um, research and existing conditions analysis. And so through all of these avenues, the draft recommendations came about. The draft recommendations fall into one of three categories. Too loud, sorry. <laughs> um, and there are a total of 10 recommendations. Um, so they fall into either the category of planning, policy, or TDM services. So there are a total of three planning recommendations. Um, the first one is exploring ways to fund TDM incentive programs. Second one is to expand safe routes to school. And the third one is around establishing um, a more formal TDM technical assistance program. And so for, for the sake of time, I won't obviously read every word. Um, you have that in your packet and then obviously on the screen, um, but just kind of want to highlight those, um, those are the main points of these three planning recommendations. And then there are also three recommendations that fall under that policy category. Um, the first one is considering integrating TDM as a requirement for certain TIP projects. Um, there's also one around reducing or removing local match requirement. Uh, and then the third one would be revising the TDM set aside scoring criteria as it relates to equity and innovation. Um, and so this just breaks down what that scoring criteria um, would would be in, in terms of revise, revisements. Um, and so again, looking at that equity and looking at the innovation criteria, um, I, I think the main point or takeaway for this slide is that we just didn't want to limit projects, um, the expansion of projects or the repetition of successful projects in the region um, based on what the criteria had described are considered as innovative. And then finally, there are um, four recommendations that fall under that TDM services category. Um, this includes um, enhancing mobility on demand assistance for member governments. It also revolves around a um, development of an annual work plan for the way to go and TMA partnership. It broadens the focus and scope of the way to go partnership to include all trips, not just commute trips. And then it also includes the development of um, new tools for TDM program evaluation. So those were the draft strategies that come out of, that came out of our um, stakeholder engagement and our internal workshop, and those will be included in the plan. Um, and then we'll launch into the draft TDM toolkit strategy. So these are separate from the draft recommendations, although they certainly go along with it. So the TDM toolkit is intended to be a resource for member governments and stakeholders, um, really kind of 
being a one-stop shop for looking at um, what types of strategies might be most applicable um, for certain land use types or um, certain use cases. So um, that is kind of the purpose of the toolkit. Um, there are a total of 31 strategies that we have decided to include in this toolkit, and they fall into seven general categories. So the categories are up on the screen here. Um, again, for purposes of time, I will not go through all the strategies, but just want to highlight a few here, and these are also included in your packet. Um, so in terms of transportation and technology, we have strategies such as micro transit and micro mobility. For TDM supportive infrastructure, we have things such as active transportation travelways, um, parking management that includes curbside management and parking policies, incentives, rebates for e-bikes, eco-pass district creation, things of the like. Um, roadway management, including roadway usage fees. So these are just kind of the um, academic strategies, if you will. And then um, once those are all laid out, each toolkit strategy will include a more in-depth description. Um, it'll also include those indicators I mentioned. So if it has low, medium, or high um, applicability in terms of land use, transit access, audience, and infrastructure, there will also be a um, equity methodology, that is the FHWA step methodology, to help those using the toolkit really think through how to implement those strategies equitably. Um, there will be a list of potential funding sources for each of those toolkit strategies, and then there will be additional case studies and resources. So really hoping that this, really aiming to have this toolkit be um, a comprehensive one-stop shop for um, member governments and users and stakeholders um, to look at those strategies in a holistic way. So in terms of next steps, um, we are reviewing the draft recommendation and toolkit strategies right now in August and September with you all, with our stakeholders, with internal staff. Um, and then we are planning to re release the um, draft plan in, in early October for public comment and have a final stakeholder meeting around that time. Um, and then like I mentioned earlier, the plan approval process through TAC, RTC, and board um, late this fall, early winter. So we will be coming back to you all um, hopefully with a finalized plan for approval. And with that, I would like to open the floor for any questions, comments, or discussions around the draft st strategic uh, recommendations or toolkit. Questions for Planner Fallon? Seeing any? Hey. Um, so, one of the things that we were looking at in Douglas County was kind of a welcome packet um, strategy. And, you know, it'd have a lot of um, both school pool, van pool, car share, a lot of things. So then when you get down into the outreach program, I don't really see kind of a welcome packet um, category other than emotional. But I don't know. I don't know what. So I was wondering, does that make sense to have something to promote that? Because we'll, you know, a lot of um, communities are experiencing growth along the front range and metro area, and we could really take advantage of some welcome pack strategy that comes out uh, when people move in and continues that um, you know, throughout the year or something. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that. Um, I would say that that probably falls under the toolkit strategy of create localized transportation information and kits. Um, I know it, it doesn't say specifically like moving information or, or new resident information, but I would say that falls under the umbrella of that localized transformation information and kits. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Thank you, Phil. Um, Kelly, uh, have you spoken to, and it may be in the TDM policies and ordinances, specifically with the uh, Unified Development Ordinances, zoning ordinances, development review ordinances that typically counties and cities have? Is it, is it important from your perspective to see a, a strong representation of those attributes, the TDM, uh, in those documents uh, and or resolution actions of, of support resolutions from counties and commissioners and thank you. Yeah, um, so I'm not quite sure if I understand the question, so I'll 
try to see if I, I understand it. So you're asking if we have talked to different um, municipalities in terms of their own zoning policies and considered the diversity of those policies within, um, for example, like the parking management tools or the, um, the policy, TDM policy and ordinance tools of the toolkit. Perfect, yes. Um, so on our stakeholder steering committee, there are several member governments, cities and counties, um, as well as on the TDM consortium. Those um, member governments are, are more like rural land use member governments. So we do have a really good representation of different member governments and um, cities and counties on our stakeholder steering committee, as well as that regional consortium. Um, in terms of talking to them specifically about their specific policies, I don't know if we've really had that, um, but I definitely think that because we have a variety of those stakeholders on those steering committees, those that have, we have vetted these with them. And so any sort of um, concerns from those members have been taken into account, um, but I will definitely let either Ron or Emily kind of add to that because um, I don't know if I, if I did your question justice there. No, Kaylee, you did a great job at that. Um, I'll just add on, I think one of our strategic plan recommendations is to build, a, build up a TDM um, technical assistance program because we did hear a lot of needs from both the land use and transportation side. Like, how can we better connect TDM and, um, and some of these topics, whether it's parking, curbside management, zoning, um, TOD. So we really thought that the best way to incorporate that into an action item is to, to specifically offer kind of technical assistance as part of the implementation of the plan. But I feel like you covered that twice. Go ahead. Thank you. So the one question I had for you, these uh, studies as part of the process, does that incorporate a cost benefit analysis? How is that applicable to the strategies that you're putting together here? So that is a great question, and I it does. It does, yeah. So there will be um, like ROI and cost as a part of those case studies. So that is um, those case studies from not only just around the region, but also nationally, internationally. So a variety of case studies there that yes will include cost and ROI. Bill? I um, just wanted to uh, express Boulder County's support for a couple of different aspects of the plan. Uh, the first being supporting and expanding the Safe Routes to School programs. Uh, the second being looking at opportunities to reduce the local match for TDM projects that focus on historically underserved communities. And then the third, the focus on non-traditional commutes and then looking at disabilities uh, and expanding language access as part of the TDM efforts. So thanks for all your work on this. Great, thank you. Kretzinger. David Kretzinger, uh, Denver alternate. Um, first, uh, applaud uh, Dr. Cog's effort to uh, to do this major overhaul. It's a lot of work here. Um, second, um, the policy recommendation to add TDM to TIP project requirements um, has some potential complexities given that TDM could be everything from zoning to operating and maintenance and education programs to capital investment. So recommend that, that some attention to that occur. Thanks. Anyone else? And thank you very much. Thank you. We'll move on to taking action on Regional Vision Zero Plan update from Emily Kleinfelter, Safety Regional Vision Zero Planner. We good? Oh. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Emily Kleinfelter. I'm the Safety and Regional Vision Zero Planner here at Dr. Cog. Um, today, we're going to give you all a little update on the work that we have been doing to um, have a bit of a strategic update to the 
implementation plan and a couple other components uh, related to our Vision Zero work. So, oh. All right, so just a reminder, um, the Vision Zero plan was adopted back in 2020 by the board and um, the Vision Zero plan makes up a lot of components, but this implementation plan is chapter six and that's really um, the real beef of what we've been focusing on for the last six to eight months um, of looking at updating as well as also creating a complementary uh, Vision Zero story map that uh, takes those crash profiles that are within this Vision Zero plan and uh, creates it into a more visual, usable resource for our, um, for our member governments. So, so a little uh, background on the structure that we had for this update is first, um, we've been doing workshops every month with the Regional Vision Zero stakeholder group, which some of you um, participate in. And the first workshop was looking at reviewing the status of our progress on the current actions within the, the 2020 plan and reviewing how far we've come and just how we feel about them. Um, and then moving forward from that, each workshop that we've done is focusing on one of the six different objectives that we've identified um, in the previous planning work um, and focusing on looking at the actions, about 10 or so actions for each um, objective and taking those and reviewing them, <clears throat> excuse me, looking at the level of impact of those actions, the difficulty to implement them within the next five years or so. Um, and then also there are follow-up surveys that are sent out after that workshop to ask for folks to prioritize um, those actions based on that objective, as well as give their input on their level of um, perceived, uh, let's say, responsibility or involvement on that action. Um, so those are sort of a lot of the ways we've been getting feedback from, your, um, from you all over the last couple of months. We have one more uh, virtual workshop coming up in a couple of weeks to cover one last objective, Objective 5, focusing on increasing funding and resources. Um, and then after that, we will be meeting together in person at the end of October, um, hopefully in this room here, to do a much more hands-on uh, workshop to really identify the tiers of action that we should be focusing on, looking at um, short-term, mid-term, and long-term um, actions and kind of scaling them down to make sure that we're fo um, focusing our resources on um, actions that are going to be impactful and that uh, folks here at the table are all able to um, participate in and, and play a part of. So that uh, workshop is coming up. But first, I want to give you all a little bit of, um, I guess, just insight on what we've been talking about at these workshops. Um, I just want to give the caveat that everything you're seeing here is all in draft form. Um, that workshop that I mentioned just now will be helping us formalize a lot of what you're seeing here. This is only based off of the feedback that I get in those regional Vision Zero work groups, as well as in the surveys that I send out. So, if you don't agree with something you may see here, but, you aren't, but your folks are maybe not participating here, I encourage you to make sure that they are going to attend the, the in-person workshop in October. Um, cause, because, excuse me, um, these top three actions that you will see are based off of the folks who filled out the survey. And um, unfortunately, you know, that doesn't always lend to being the most uh, equitable of feedbacks, right? Not everybody is able to take the time to fill that out. So what you're seeing here are, um, may not reflect your views, but are reflecting the folks who are filling out these follow-up surveys to, to state their priorities. Um, so I'm not going to get too deep into what these actions are because um, some of them honestly may not even be here uh, when we bring you the final plan. The idea is for us to really review these and, and um, maybe even slim down the number of actions and um, understand where we make the most uh, impact. So the first objective, as a reminder, is looking at improving collaboration between allied agencies, something that I think Dr. Cog really excels at. And so um, these top three actions here that you'll see have a different variety of, we see of uh, ability to implement it or its expected impact. Um, and you'll see that that kind of favoring between the impact and the difficulty to implement will stay the same 
uh, not stay the same, but will be somewhat consistent among many of the objectives and their actions. Um, but we do have um, a handful of other new actions that have also come to the table that you'll see are somewhat more impactful, but also going to be difficult to implement. And I think that's where we need to start maybe paying a little closer attention. Um, so you'll see here this new objective, or sorry, action on the bottom um, did show that it was going to be a medium to high impact and uh, was one of the higher priority actions. So objective two, we are looking at increasing awareness and adoption of Vision Zero. Again, um, it kind of goes back and forth on the level of impact and difficulty to implement these different actions. Um, these were some of the top three that we heard were important to folks from that uh, stakeholder group. And then um, there weren't very many changes to this one. I wanted to um, note as well, we do have some new actions that are being recommended um, and revisions to previous actions. So I just want to note that as well. Objective three is looking at designing and retrofitting roadways to prioritize safety and lower speeds. Um, I'm going to call out this bottom, um, actually these middle two actions. So we have providing guidance on the implementation of quick build projects is the previous action from the 2020 plan. But with some revisions, we have um, kind of thought the idea that of actually creating a, an actual toolkit as a resource would be a more impactful item. And uh, it was, as we've heard from the group, a medium to high level impact. And then this other one that looks to, in a vague way, prioritize construction, not vague, excuse me, um, just we want to we wanna make sure that we are prioritizing construction and maintenance on our uh, high injury network. But I think that when we're looking at the way we specify actions, it really helps to put in detail. So we revise that to um, make sure that we're doing this um, action in a more detailed manner. And so we're um, looking at prioritizing the funding, design, and implementation of at least four complete streets or Vision Zero projects along the High and Dream Network on an annual basis. Um, and again, that one was seen to be an incredibly high impact, but much more difficult to implement. Objective four is looking at data collection and reporting, which I would like to say we are doing a lot of great work on and also seems to be of great interest to the region. Um, I'm excited to have my colleague Eric speak on the crash data consortium work that he's been diligently working on for the last eight months or so. Um, and, and kind of give you all an update on that work, but we will continue to be focusing on that as you see here, because it seems as though focusing on data is going to lend to creating an impact. Um, excuse me, sorry, I wanted to call out this bottom uh, action here, analyzing crashes to understand high risk actions. We suggested revising it um, to every three to five years. We've heard feedback from folks that Doing a um, crash analysis on an annual basis maybe isn't as productive and looking at doing it less frequently and in those interim years, we're actually working on putting those plans or the things we learn from the analysis in action and, and um, putting projects in place. Lastly, objective six is to increase legislative support. And we have added a couple of new actions here looking at um, improving straight state driver education around interactions with bikes and pedestrians, bicycle riders and pedestrians, excuse me, and also um, legislation that's looking to enable um, approaches for local agencies to look at setting the speed limits on state-owned roadways, which I know might be a hot topic for some. Oh, excuse me, Sorry, I have a couple of uh, additions here. So the pursue legislation, we wanted to change to support because Dr. Cog, as much as we have, um, do have folks who have that on our staff to do that work, I think that my current uh, capacity is better spent working on some of the other actions. So we're looking at um, supporting rather than in the, um, in the near term of pursuing. And then lastly, I wanted to talk about our Vision Zero story map, which I'm really excited to um, hopefully have out to you all in the next month or so. We have been working really hard with our GIS team to put together this resource for the region. It's taking all of the um, really great analysis work that our team did a couple years ago, taking um, 
the area types across the region into account and breaking down the crashes based on those area types. Um, and so this story map is going to help visually explore the types of crashes that are happening across the region based on the area types. And you may ask, what is the area type? Well, we're looking at those based on the population density and employment density. Um, and so that helps us identify our um, urban, suburbans, or compact communities, our rural communities, and our limited access highways. And so, you know, a crash that happens on a rural roadway is going to be a lot different than a crash that happens here on right outside on 17th Street. So we have to look at the countermeasures differently, and that is one of the things that we dig into a little bit deeper with this resource. Here's just a little preview of what the um, story map, if you're on one of the, if you're on the urban crash profiles page, this is sort of the, the landing page and you would scroll down and it'll um, give you information. You'll have maps, you'll have statistics, and then you'll have um, information on countermeasures. And then we're also going to be um, incorporating a, a tab or excuse me, like a, these are all tabs here. So a tab about implementing Vision, Vision Zero with additional resources for our local agencies as well as hopefully highlighting a couple of projects across the region that we've seen um, implemented, implemented that are um, improving safety for road users. And just wrapping that up with next steps, like I mentioned, we do have the in-person prioritization workshop coming up in October. And then after that work is done, it'll be a lot of uh, hard work from staff to do the, the cleaning up and internal edits and review. And then we hope to have a um, draft, or a actually not draft, a, a version ready to release out to the public for co public comment in December. And then in the first quarter of uh, next year, 2024, we hope to be bringing this to these committees and then the board for adoption. So with that, um, open it up for any questions. Questions? We did have some issues, I believe, with the animation of the slides that didn't make it into the packets. Ah, There's apologies. There's a little bit of issue there, but uh, I think we understand with your presentation. Thanks. Yeah. You give your name and... Justin Begley, City County of Denver. Thanks, Emily. Um, really good presentation. A lot of good content. It, it actually sprung up a question for me, um, and it's the role of evaluation, I think. Um, was it explicitly discussed? Is that something that may fall or should fall to the locals um, who are implementing these these things? I just was curious about it because I think you, you mentioned you're going to have some um, example projects, some corridors that were implemented that improve safety. And I'll just say, like, um, when I dabble in this, I look at, like, you know, the treatments and the crash reduction factors and such. And I just wonder, I don't know, and this is nothing against us or anybody, like how well we do going back later and seeing like, did this do what we thought it would do? Um, but I'm just curious if there's a role for like structured evaluation as part of um, this or if it, it should fall to others. I love that feedback and I appreciate it so much. Thank you, Justin. Um, you know, I think that that's something that can fit into one of the um, objectives and the actions that we're working on. I highly encourage you or somebody from your staff to attend um, the upcoming Vision Zero work, like the virtual workshop where we're discussing increasing funding and resources. Um, you know, I think that there's a lot of opportunity for us to, to look at ways to evaluate ourselves in all different manners, um, as well as whether it's yielding the results we want from a, a single project or um, looking at the whole scale of this actual plan. Um, one of the things I'm wanting to take into account is making sure we have a structured or a structure created to keep ourselves accountable on these actions that we set and the progress that we're making on them. Um, we we want to make sure that we um, you know are keeping ourselves on track. Your name please. Mike Whitaker, City of Lakewood. Um, thanks, Emily. I like seeing some of the additions. Um, having police, uh, healthcare, and some of the other changes you made are really good. Hopefully, that'll bring some of the fractured um, the members back to the table and, and discussing it. Um, I think the devil's in the details. Um, we talk about data profiles and crashes, um, but you only know what you know, and you don't know what you don't know. 
Um, for those cities that are running cameras, I don't know how you sleep at night if you're not recording those. It has changed the way we operate our city. It has changed the police function, it has changed accountability in public work staff, it's changed accountability in contractors. We get to see these crashes. Almost all of them we've caught on video. And so I'll give you a great example. Colfax and Garrison in front of the Safeway. There was a lady riding a bike the wrong way up Colfax. Pickup ran her over. He was going the wrong way on Colfax as well. And if you look at the diagram, it would just say there's two people going the wrong way on Colfax. Watch the video. He intentionally crossed over the median at an intersection to go the wrong way and run her up from behind. Turns out after a lot of investigation that she was a bicycle thief who had stole a bicycle like a month earlier from this guy and he recognized her. It was attempted murder. But we wouldn't know that from a data diagram. You're not gonna see that. You're just gonna see two dots going the same way. That's the type of things that are gonna make a difference. In Lakewood, since 2016, all our crashes have gone down, serious bodily injuries. We're running about two thirds of what we used to in 2016 because we know what we know and we can see what we need to fix and how things are happening. Got to get into the crash reports. You got to see it. All our staff now had to go through the FBI accreditation, had to get fingerprinted so they can see the crash reports unredacted. If you're serious about getting to vision zero, that's what it's gonna take. You gotta know what you're trying to fix. One of the things I would say on the crash profiles is missing. It's uncomfortable, but drug and alcoholism, we all know in our cities where it's at. Somehow we gotta pull that out because over half my fatalities are in a one mile section of Colfax. In the whole city, that one mile section is half of my fatalities. It's crazy, but that area is different enough. We got to be able to call it out in a profile. And I think the rest of you have to do it in your cities as well. If we're serious about getting to vision zero, the, re the response is going to be totally different than what you think it is. Mike? Mike? Thanks, Phil. Uh, thanks, Justin and, and Mike, for those comments. And Emily, thank you for the presentation. I, too, was pleased to see the inclusion of that new uh, segment for, to uh, better include police and health, health uh, healthcare in the conversation. And kind of like Mike, I, my concerns uh, aren't for the, the presentation. It's really a long-term viability of this program, in my view, is, as Mike was saying, it's really going to come down to what the local governments can put into the mix and, you know, the crash data and the, the cameras and videos, that's great. I agree with that. But I also am thinking about prior to the crash, you know, in terms of enforcement, uh, speeding is something that I'm just seeing so much more of whatever municipality I'm in. And I know in, in my own neighborhood, I see this, you know, we have the signs and I have neighbors asking me all the time, well, what does that mean? And so I explain it, but, then, then someone speeds down the street, and this is a you know obviously a 20 mile an hour zone, but you know that's not on Dr. Cog, that's not on you know the a big plan. It's on the local governments for enforcement, and it's going to be tough. And that's why I agree that that little you know temperature reading there is moderate to hard. But without that, the emperor has no clothes. And we could be talking about Vision Zero, meeting after meeting after meeting, and congratulating ourselves about a great plan, but it's going to mean very little unless this gets highly prioritized by every local government, city, and county um, to make a difference. You know, for example, there's not enough signage. Uh, and is signage alone going to do it? No. But I see gaps, long gaps, in, and, and I'm told by the city of Boulder that, well, no, that's, that's the appropriate uh, distance for the signs. And so, again, my criticisms are not directed at Emily, certainly at you or anyone in the room. It's really at all of us to say, if we're serious about this, we're kind of going in the wrong direction, I think, because I think it's got to be that item, that police and 
healthcare is is a connection there as well, but it's really about the local governments and the commitment, and it can't just be among the many, many priorities that local governments have. It's going to be tough, but without it, it's just paper. But thank you. What else? I respond. Um, so thank you so much for all of your comments. I really appreciate them. Um, so with this update to the plan, one of the, the things that we're really taking into account is that in the field of transportation safety, um, you know, we continue to talk about Vision Zero, and, and it's this goal um, that we want to achieve, but there isn't sometimes feel, feel like there's a plan. But so I, um, I'd be really happy to come and speak more about the safe systems approach at another time. But what we're using here, Dr. Cog, is the safe systems approach. And it's, it's not a new thing. It's something that is nationally, internationally renowned. And it breaks it down pretty simple that humans make mistakes and we're vulnerable. Um, and we need to make sure that we're designing our roadways and putting all the other sort of safety nets in place so that when humans make those inevitable mistakes, they're not going to cost someone their life or limb. Or serious injury. And so, um, you know, there is no, no doubt that there are people who are making bad decisions in all types or on all modes um, on our roadways. But for the most part, a lot of drivers and all users of the roadways are, are really just wanting to get from point A to point B safely. And um, we have to continue to collaborate to work together to get to that goal. But one of the things that we have to continue to remind ourselves is that humans are we're fallible, we're gonna make mistakes. And so we as the people who have the power to put the money into the projects or to put the word out to our populations or whatever it may be, to continue to work together and make sure that we are making it so that when we make a mistake, cause guess what, I'm gonna make a mistake one day and everyone else in this room might do that. And so we wanna make sure that that mistake isn't gonna cost us our life. Um, so thank you very much. I really appreciate all your comments. Thank you. There are nothing, no other comments for Eric Kleinfelter. Then we'll go on to Regional Crash Data Consortium update from Eric Brayton. All right, thank you all for being here. My name is Eric Broden. I am a planner here at Dr. Cog, and I have been working for the past almost year or so here working and coordinating what we're calling our regional crash data consortium. And I'm really proud to say that I've spoken with a lot of people in this room, and your work is really what is guiding the content of this presentation and what we're going to be doing um, throughout the rest of this process with this grant. So, the crash data consortium is really funded by a NHTSA grant, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. 405C is a program for improving traffic records, and our primary goals are to investigate and demonstrate the value of a regional crash data consortium, to inventory the needs of the region, and to work to identify and address common issues with crash data collection, processing, and analysis. Through this process, we have spoken to a number of folks um, from law enforcement, engineering, planning, um, public health, the Department of Transportation, Department of Revenue, and really just trying to see what we can do together as a group to address some of these challenges with crash data. A couple of goals um, expressly laid out in our grant on related to the completeness of records, the integration of records to different systems, and the accessibility of this data. I'm not getting into the details, but really we're trying to, with these, increase the number of records that already have um, latitude and longitude coming into the system that don't need to be geocoded after the fact by either CDOT, Dr. Cog, or any of the many member governments or organizations working with crash data. We're working to integrate these records to um, linear referencing systems in order to better aid the analysis of this data and bring in more data points to it, as well as um, making sure this data is accessible to member governments and those who want to use this data in the region of traffic safety. I can dwell on this, but just wanted to show, um, as, a, as the Dr. Cog region is about 57% of the population in Colorado as of 2020, 
it is a little overrepresented in the number of total crashes as well as those seriously injured. And so we really hope that if we can work as a group to improve the, the crash data that can lower the number of crashes in our, in our region, that will make, make a huge effect on our states and can serve as a model to other regions in Colorado. We started this effort late last year, and we had a kickoff meeting in November where we convened a number of stakeholders. We used this opportunity to invite folks to speak with us through a number of surveys and through some interviews. And we have been meeting with been active in other groups to just gain, gain knowledge and insights into crash data in the region. We had a meeting of our group in May where we had representatives from the Department of Revenue and Department of Transportation share with us their processes for taking crash data once they receive it from law enforcement. Um, one of our colleagues, Jenny Wallace, our GIS manager, spoke to the, the work that she and her team do to process the data on our end. And we shared out a summary of this presentation as well, or something similar to this. We have been taking this input from this inventory to form our needs assessment, and we, were, we are going to be publishing the results of our, a draft of our inventory and needs assessment towards the middle of September, and we will invite some feedback from this group and the rest of our stakeholders to um, let us know what they think about it, if there's anything that um, needs to be updated or changed, and just to, um, let us know if we're on the right track with this, because really this is a group effort, and we want to make sure that all those voices are heard. Through next year, we will be working to take this needs assessment to guide our development and implementation of solutions to some of these challenges that we're identifying. Um, I'm going to be spending some time looking at, or we, my, call, my colleagues and I will be looking at what some other MPOs are doing, what other states are doing on this issue. We'll be having a, we're calling our a final meeting of this um, towards the end of the year and publishing out a full report of what we have learned. As part of our engagement process, we have had a number of surveys go out to uh, members of this body and other, other groups um, related to Dr. Cog. Um, we, I've had conversations with, I think, 40, 40 50 individuals um, representing, or about 40 individuals representing about 50 organizations. Um, They're really insightful. We, again, we had several meetings of the consortium, and we have been working with other related groups, including uh, my colleague Emily's Regional Vision Zero Working Group as well as the State Traffic Record Advisory Committee's Crash Manual Task Force, which, and this is a task force is really interesting because it was founded because the crash, the form that law enforcement used to update or to collect data for the crashes was updated in 2019. And there's not a real way to change that form in the short term, but there are, before the task force is really hoping to identify ways in which the form can be easily understood. The, the manual is 300 pages long, and so trying to make it a little more user-friendly for law enforcement to make sure that this, this important information is being collected correctly. The quick breakdown of some of the folks we've spoken with um, it needs to be updated because keep, I keep talking to new folks all the time. But most of the folks we've talked to have been from the municipal level or from the county level. Um, we've talked to, I believe, 30 of our member governments um, in one way or another. So I'm really happy about that, as well as a lot of folks from the states um, some of the federal level advocacy groups, um, some fire districts, higher ed, and a couple of the other MPOs in the state. Data sources that are mainly used from what, we, what I've learned from this group has been really what's coming from the municipal police, um, Colorado State Patrol, and some counties which collect crash data um, when the CIS, um, Colorado State Patrol doesn't. This data typically goes then to, or this data is retained by those organizations goes to DOR, uh, Department of Revenue, and goes on to CDOT. We get access to that data from CDOT. Um, we're very grateful to be a partner with CDOT on this and are able to do some edit, do some analysis with that and geocoding us some records and publish that, which is available on our regional data catalog. And we've also talked to some folks from some, several of the fire districts in the area who maintain their own records. They collect records that are a little bit different than what the police have, and they kind of they respond to different things. So some of those are not, will not show up as the same as within the municipal data. And so that's something that we're looking at, looking into, seeing if there's maybe a way to integrate that data, um, as well as some of the records that are collected by emergency departments. So this is a bit more complicated with privacy. So that's kind of been a tough nut to crack, but we are kind of, we're look, looking into that. And also what we have heard from some of our stakeholders is while there are more organizations in this, there are two major vendors that a lot of our member governments and stakeholders work with that kind of approach the issue of crash data differently, so they're represented here as 
One thing that we've, a couple things we've learned from some stakeholders on the difference between this local municipal data, municipal or county or CSP data, versus the data that is available from the state and then later from Dr. Cog, is really the lot, a lot comes to the timeliness of the data and the quality and value add-ins to the data. A lot of our local governments we've spoken with do have access to some of the law enforcement records. A lot of them have relationships where they can reach, the engineers or planners may be able to reach out to their, their police or their sheriff's officers, department office, and get records from them. Um, they, a lot of the analysts are working on that, but they are not going through quite the same level of detailed QC and analysis that we've seen that the data that CDOT goes through in some cases. But a trade-off of that is that oftentimes this data can be accessed much quicker than data that's coming from the state and then from, from us once we're able to talk, touch it. And sometimes there are elements of it that can be, um, at, that can be looked at different ways as um, Mr. Whitaker spoke about how there can be connections with some of their police data that isn't available in the CDOT data. When it comes to the data that is from CDOT and from Dr. Cog, we've been told time and time again that it's useful to help identify trends, see how communities are comparing to one another, because as you can imagine, one community can't, they may, as much as one community may be able to reach out to their PD, they're not going to look at the data from a neighboring city or county. Um, so state and Dr. Cog data can be useful to see how a community compares or if there are cross-jurisdictional issues that are happening. The data goes through extensive quality checks. Um, we've seen, we've had demonstrations from CDOT about how they go in and individually work on different records and catch a lot of, um, catch a lot of errors sometimes. But again, the trade-off, as we understand it, is that it's not always recent enough to take into account for engineering decisions or for planning or other things. Sometimes it takes up to a year, a year and a half to get this data from CDOT. I'm not gonna dwell on this because it would take way too long and it's in the middle of the afternoon, but this is just a, a really, it's a model that I developed to help myself kind of try to understand how um, data flows in the region. Um, I caveat this, it's non-exhaustive, and there's more out there that isn't captured by this, but I try to try to get across how there's different pathways which data flows, there's different data sources that individuals are using. There's not one single crash data out there that exists in the region. Some of the main issues and problems we've encountered um, from what we've heard from our stakeholders is that many of the local governments and other agencies, other organizations don't have access to consistently geocoded data. Some, we've, we've learned through this process that some, even some, of, and even some of the reports that have latitude and longitude are suspect and there may be, they, the crash might be at, might be reported at an intersection so the, the, the computer data dispatch, the law enforcement users will code it at that intersection. Turns out the crash is actually the next intersection over. That's recorded in the report saying where the actual location was, but the latitude and longitude might not be correct. Um, and that is even, that's if there even is that location being captured. Um, we've heard from a lot of our stakeholders that their organizations, their counties, their, or their um, law enforcement aren't even capturing that information, whether it's technological, whether it's the way that the way that the law enforcement agency does its business. It's just oftentimes it's not available in the first place. Um, as I mentioned before, the timeliness of data is important. Um, we've heard that the state data can be considered out of date. It um, takes a while to get that data, um, so there's an appetite to get that data from other sources sometimes, um, whether that's from local law, whether that's from local decision makers or from st staff or other organizations who want We've heard that the consistency of police reports ties in with the location, but the consistency is something that is, we've heard time and time again, whether that's the location, whether that's the spelling, um, something as minor, which may seem as minor as whether a law enforcement is recording something as 38th Street versus West 38th Street can really have an effect on some of the analysis as things are being geocoded and looked at. Um, Sometimes the, a narrative is provided, is an option to be provided in the reports that can be very helpful for analysts to look at, get a, get a full understanding of the situations of a crash or do a data check on what's in the fields, and, but sometimes that's not reported. And the interesting thing that we've explored is the, 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 a field on the form about impairments. There's a field on the form about impairments, but whether it's suspected, and it's, while it's not supposed to be meant as any sort of legally binding 
um, fact. It is something we've heard from some of our law enforcement partners that some officers are a little hesitant to select that because there might be some perceived repercussions of that in the future. So we're seeing, and we've heard from stakeholders that there are discrepancies in the state data for a number of crashes showing that there's far fewer crashes that are associated with impairment than are being found out later on in the municipal data and later on through the, through the um, justice process sometimes. Finally, as far as issues touch on accessibility, um, one key part of accessibility with it is just really the relationships between the law enforcement and some of the data users downstream. Um, we've heard that, well, I've heard from everyone that the work that law enforcement is doing is critically important and that they understand that, you know, when people are, when law enforcement is on the scene of a crash, you know, the safety is paramount. They want to make sure that they are taken care of. They know there's a lot, the form is seven pages long. There's a lot that they're asking, we're asking um, law enforcement to do. And so I think there's been a pretty universal recognition of that from the people I've spoken to, that it is a challenging task. And, but when it comes down to the way that data sharing goes, we've heard that some of our local partners have phenomenal relationships with their law enforcement. They're able to get, us, get data from them pretty easily, collaborative work on them, compare the data with them. And we've heard from others that they have a very hard time. They are not able to get that data very quickly, if at all. And so, as you might imagine, these relationships vary between these different. One, another final point about accessibility I'll mention is um, I have heard is that from some that they're unsure of where to get data and what is currently available. So, and that's a key part of this. We want to make sure that people have the resources to work on this if they, if they have a need with this data, which I'm sure every organization here does, um, whether that's for engineering, whether that's for enforcement, whether that's for education. These are all huge topics that our stakeholders have spoken to us about. So we wanna make sure that people have access to the most up-to-date data and the data that is available is accurate and as complete as possible. And so we're gonna to hope to, we're, hoping, we're planning to be able to make sure that this information gets out and is easily accessible by stakeholders and those in the public who want to use it. Over this next few months and year, we're gonna be completing this needs assessment. Um, and as I said, we'll be sharing it out over the next couple of weeks. And we will be asking for some feedback on that from all of you. Um, I will be doing some more pointed additional law enforcement engagement. We've been fortunate to speak to a number of law enforcement, I've spoken to police chiefs, I've spoken to traffic units, um, sergeants or, and lieutenants, but it's really I'm planning to do a bit more and get that perspective because I think it's very, their law enforcement is of course, a very important role, has a very important role um, in this process. Um, we'll be working on and speaking to some of our partner organizations and um, like other M MPOs, um, seeing what other state DOTs are doing. And again, working on developing and implementing solutions to a lot of these challenges. We are having our next meeting of this consortium on September 28th, um, 10 to 11.30 a.m. And that will be by Zoom. So at that, that meeting, again, we'll be going over this, the inventory and needs assessments and inviting comments on what's, what, getting to get your reception and inviting comments on how it can be improved to make sure that this is reflective of the work, reflective of the attitudes and, and facts on the ground so we can shape this, this work going forward. I invite any, all of you to join and um, the link is on our Dr. Kai website uh, event page but if you would like to get more information about it or get, a, get a, my contact information so I can send it to you, um, I will be here in the room after the meeting. Please come up for me and I'd happy to get that for you. And with that, I would like to ask if you all have any questions. Yeah, sorry, Eric, could you go back one slide to the consortium meeting? Yeah, I just want to make a finer point here. Um, you know, to Mike Whitaker's comments on the last presentation and to Frank's and others' comments, this really is where the rubber is hitting the road in terms of some of those very specific data issues, um, coordination issues, all of those very kind of micro-specific things that you all rightfully point out make a real difference. This is where we're getting into those details, and I really want to strongly encourage either you, your staff, or your colleagues to attend this meeting. It's an open meeting. Um, all are welcome. We really want to get people together at our first couple meetings we've had in the range of 70 folks. Um, so we'd like to get at least that many, if not more, um, because it's really that stakeholder coordination that's going to make a difference at the end of the day. Thank you. Are there any questions? Sorry for butchering your name earlier. One? 
Eric, thank you very much. Thanks for your work on this. I think as it's pointed, been pointed out, and I think we all understand, data is really important. If we're actually going to make a difference and, and really chip away at this kind of persistent safety problem um, on our transportation system. And I guess if I boil it down, what I'm hearing is what's really important is that we get available, timely, and accurate data out of the system. And, and timely, timely is, is really critical there. Um, so maybe without spoiling a, pun a future punchline, sort of where is it being done well or better than it's being done here? And, you know, what are some of the potential sort of solutions or, or what are maybe what are some of the barriers that we're experiencing in our system in this region, in this state that we might try to tackle? Yeah, thanks, Dean, Ron. Yeah, I had the opportunity to go to the, I always, at SIP, American Transportation Safety Improvement Professionals <laughs> Traffic Records Forum um, in Nashville this um, this July with my colleague Jacob, um, thanks to the thanks to STRAC, and there we learned from that a lot of states already have geocoded data. They get it right at the source. Um, they may, they may employ some different methods to get that data. For example, um, Wisconsin is coming to mind as a state that they they have. They, they get geocoded data. Most, most of them, they get the records geocoded at the scene with law enforcement. But they also have people who pretty much daily will go through it and they'll update that. And they get that data onto a dashboard geolocated with the facts that they know at the time um, associated with each record practically in, in real time. And so I think that's a really great example. Um, they also have a lot of really cool analytical tools they built into that. Um, we got to see some great dashboards from Connecticut. A um, few other states that have are really on the cutting edge of this kind of data collection. One thing that it was kind of surprising to me at that meeting, at that conference, was that the, the other presenters were talking about, oh, we have our, this is our dashboard with our data, and I was like, well, how do you get all that that data? It's like, well, what do you mean? We just get we just get the data from our police, or we get it from the, the DOT, and they, it seems kind of like a silly question to, that they would have up-to-date data um, that quickly, almost in real time. So I think there's definitely some ways that we can work together to improve some of these processes. Uh, we've had some really great conversations even within the last few months um, with DOR, with CDOT. Um, we've been collaborating with CDOT to take their 2021 data for our region and QCing it and giving it back to them. And we feel like we have a really strong relationship with the folks there um, to really get that together. And so I think there are great examples out there as well as um, I'm interested to learn more about how other states, other regions, how they manage the multiple records management systems used by law enforcement agencies. Um, and I was just speaking with a lieutenant this morning, and we were talking about how they're, they're one of the biggest cities in our region, and their system is not very user-friendly for collecting that data, but they can't really use another system because that they're the system that connects to their crash data also connects to everything else in their universe. And so it would be very cost prohibitive at this time, um, resources that they currently have to do that. So that's something that I really want to look into exploring if there's ways that we can look up at. Is there a different program we can all use or, or we can together and other funding streams that as an organization, as a consortium, we can look at getting towards to maybe, maybe help organizations who want to update their software, want to use different programs, but can't at the moment. Maybe that's a way that we can leverage this group to get those resources to those organizations of those processes in there. Any other questions for Planner Bratton? Okay, thank you. Move on to CDOT Region 1 Bicycle and Pedestrian Safety Study, attachment E in your, in your packet. Emily Kleinfelter will be introducing this one as well. Thank you. Hello again. Um, 
So this afternoon, I'm also going to be giving uh, a little quick update, or well, I'll be letting Zeb here tell you all about the CDOT Region 1 Bicycle and Pedestrian Safety Study. Um, so Dr. Cog staff participated on the um, TAC, so the Technical Advisory Committee, um, and we were really happy to be involved in this because the, the goals of this study were really aligned with the work that Dr. Cog is um, working on, is both within our Vision Zero goals, of course, with safety, our active transportation goals, um, and as well as just looking at the Metro Vision plan, this really aligns with the work that Dr. Cog um, does and wants to support. And so um, I'm really excited to have Zeb here tell you all about the, the great work that they did um, and what's come from it. So, yeah. Just, yeah. Everyone. Um, thank you everyone for inviting us to uh, present to you the CDOT Region 1 Bicycle and Pedestrian Safety Study. Um, my name is Azeev Seifu. Um, I work in CDOT Region 1 Traffic Safety and uh, operation unit. Um, for, so this is a study uh, we were able to work with Michael and Baker um, uh, alongside to present uh, the study. Um, so the purpose of the study is the goal of the study is to improve uh, safety and bicycle um, through CBOT Region 1 roadways. Uh, the overall intent of the study is to approach it in a way that it's a proactive and uh, which is a systemic analysis and uh, reactive approach as uh, crash data-driven analysis for bicycle and pedestrian safety. Um, and it's a guide to identify uh, crash history areas of potential risks, as well as uh, for bicycle and pedestrian concern, a list of safety um, countermeasures that could apply to state or local roadways. Um, Last bullet there, the final report to support future safety grant applications. Uh, so the report was meant to be useful for identification of a uh, program of projects, working collaboratively with yourself, local agencies, and funding opportunities by leveraging its data, recommendation, cost estimates, um, concept designs, and information to successfully pursue grants to find Im implementation of safety uh, countermeasure for state and local uh, roads. <laughs> so um, the project team consists of Region 1, CDOT staff, RTD, Dr. Cog. Um, and just since Dr. Cog, uh, uh, Region 1 is fully encompassed within Dr. Cog uh, region. Uh, so the project team met uh, three to four times a week just to go through the progress of the study. Uh, there was also a technical advisory committee. Um, there were five meetings uh, as part of the project's lifetime. Um, there were about um, two about two members that came from counties and cities, um, as well as uh, about the project. So uh, we were able to get these groups together to provide some technical um, assumptions and processes, uh, disseminating information to the public and local agency staff as well as any feedback that we, we would be receiving and just constructive voice um, of their community perspective on bicycle and pedestrian ability.
technical difficulties. Um, so the study um, also so looked at uh, network screening, which is uh, evaluation of crash history and available roadway data to help identify roadways uh, with potential uh, for higher risk. Uh, network screening was conducted in two components, um, systemic analysis, which would go over uh, the slide, um, and then it also looked at crash analysis. So um, the first step of, was to conduct the crash analysis. We were able, able to um, get 2,222 total crashes involving uh, high school and pedestrians. Um, so, so we were, saw uh, 68% of it being pedestrian crashes and 32 high school crashes. And the overall purpose of this analysis was to determine which crash was involving bicycle and pedestrians uh, and areas of, you know, which roadways that those were happening. And then just the constructed on the network and what the level of uh, severity was for those crashes, looking at fatality, um, injuries, and property damage. So all of those was um, on region uh, roads where it was broken down to half a mile segment and scored based on the number of severity of bicycle and pedestrians. Uh, so for instance, you know, Fado would receive 100 points, uh, injuries will receive 50 points, and property damage will receive uh, 25 points. So those points were added together for each segment um, to come up with highest scores. Uh, so these locations that were identified to being higher risk is anything from 400 points or above. So from those lists, they were, we were able to identify 15 crash hotspot locations, where 12 of them are intersection and um, three of them are segment. Uh, the map you see on the right there um, that runs east-west is Colfax, um, the black indicating that there has been a higher, high score for that area of the region, and which references high density and um, um, of severity of crashes. Uh, one thing to note, um, I scored locations for city and county of Denver uh, were identified for this study, but we did not, we are able to evaluate it further uh, for potential countermeasures because city and county of Denver at the time had similar effort um, that they were addressing pedestrian uh, bicycle safety. So these are the list of 15 uh, uh, hotspot crash locations, um, which has the highest number of severity of crashes. Um, so as you can see, uh, this is ranging from 1,000 to 400 points, like from uh, Aura all the way to um, Lakewood we have in there as well. So they're about like, 11 of those are uh, on Colfax Avenue, and where seven are in City of Aurora, six are in Lakewood, and two are in City of Glendale. Uh, so the second component of the network screening is the systemic analysis. Uh, the analysis evaluated 10 roadway characteristics or uh, risk factors um, to just define the level of risk that they pose on bicycle and pedestrians. So a few of them are mentioned here, like the annual daily traffic volume, presence of lighting, posted speed limit, uh, shoulder width, uh, and presence of sidewalk and bike lane. Um, so after reviewing the risk factors, risk scores were calculated based on the relative level of risk. Each factor adds on to the roadway network. So for instance, um, for 30 miles per hour or lower speed limit, uh, you would be considering for the score as compared to 45 miles per hour or above would be considered as a high. 
the score where it applied to each of the half a mile segments uh, that was uh, defined in the crash analysis of the step one of the study. Uh, so the map So the map shows the results of the combined risk force by segments. Um, segments of the higher risk are defined as a red line, which is representing the need for uh, bicycle and pedestrian safety and the consideration of countermeasures. Um, the orange and yellow section of the road represents um, low, lower level of risk. So um, the systemic analysis is becoming more common safety study these days, so it's, since it's a proactive approach to identifying areas of elevated risk, um, may or may not have the history of crashes, uh, but these locations of fewer crashes such as the suburbs can actually benefit uh, for this data just to justify uh, the countermeasures to apply for grants or funding. As part of the systemic analysis, uh, there was a network screening um, of that went into the public input. Um, so in there, they, we were able to uh, interactive survey called MetRequest. And these were available for six weeks. Um, so the survey participants were able to provide general inputs and ideas, thoughts on obstacles they face, uh, either walking or biking within the region general input on uh, the map of the region itself. So we were able to receive uh, 2,300 people, participants, and over uh, 5,800 uh, data points on the map portion of the survey. Uh, the heat map that you see on the right here is, is the blue dots uh, that's more spread out are representing individual or fewer comments. Um, and then the red and yellow portion of the survey, uh, or the map here, is looking at sort of the comments that were received. So, which is telling us that you know there is going to be a potential for bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure needs, and also more likely to have um, or improvement support. And concentration of uh, participant comments were identified at hot spots which were cross-referenced with the systemic risk scores and placed under highest to lowest. Which are listed on this list here, um, which is looking at um, the highest one ranging from Lakewood to Aurora, and then City of Lakewood to next highest. Um, and for the um, and then the next portion of this slide would be representing from um, Golden to anywhere from Jefferson Jeffco unincorporated uh, town of Bennett would be also considered as uh, low in the risk scores even though we did receive more comments in this area, but uh, when we cross-reference it with the systemic analysis, there were four scores in overall. So the other components we were able to bring up is the context fact factors. Um, which evaluated uh, some of these systemic scores as well as the MetroQuest survey uh, that we received from uh, the local um, public survey. And since the Region 1 Dr. Cog area is incorporated, incorporated into their data, we 
we're able to provide uh, stream focus facility, high injury network, um, as well as uh, the surrounding uh, land use uh, proximity to transit, uh, proximity or connection to exposed uh, bike lanes and facilities, as well as distributing distribution of urban and rural locations uh, and boundary roadways. <coughs> So this diagram shows us just a summary of what we have um, provided as we look into hotspot location list, where the MetroQuest was um, worked with, you know, to bring in the systemic risk scores, uh, contacts factors, as well as, you know, getting information from remove some of these uh, locations if it's already planned or funded. With that, we were able to bring up these six. So, so the resulting of these locations are noted. Uh, you'll notice some of these are um, have boundaries. Uh, City of Westminster and County of Adams, uh, where we would be needing more uh, as coordination for these type of locations. Um, the top three locations had relative high network risk scores, uh, pedestrian focus areas, um, as well as the medium to high level vulnerability, uh, high injury network. Um, and but on the first one, there's a quarter mile uh, to RTD station. Second one, there's a connection to and multi use trail. Uh, as you'll see on the third one, uh, was but as a top crash location, although lower on the list. As noted earlier, we, you know, one of the considerations for the top systemic is to provide distribution of location between urban and rural. For the last three, um, Bennett, Anna Bennett comes in um, as a ruler and it looks at medium vulnerability as well as uh, providing connection to school, parks, and libraries. These are the combined list of the top crash location as well as the systemic location. I've identified uh, five of them to uh, forward for the top location, four in City of Aurora and one in Glendale. And uh, from the previous slide, the uh, six systemic location were identified. So um, once we knew our top 11 locations able to provide and go back to the data and conduct some site visits, um, site-specific data information, location countermeasures, uh, these are some of the lists of that we were able to pull in. Uh, most common ones like curb extensions, uh, signal rebuild, uh, protected mid-block crossing, and just less common ones, maybe improvements to shift left lane, um, turn lanes to remove any offsets, um, tightening curb radia uh, to slow vehicles, and just placing the turn wider medians for uh, pedestrian refuge. Um, it was really important to note as well, like not all these improvements are applicable anywhere, uh, so it's better to get to look at the context factors on this. And so the next step for CDOT was to invest in uh, implementing these projects or locations. Um, so the first uh, under design, we have five locations that's moving um, with Vision Zero funding, uh, Colfax from Moline to our area, and Colfax in Havana, and Colfax in Chambers, where three of them are located in the city of Aurora. And uh, town of Bennett, we were able to Colfax and Adam and first and Cynthia part of that effort. And then just moving on to the H of Faster grant application, we were able to get that going for Colfax and Moline, 
Elmer Avenue and Oddsworth 20 segment for 20 and the two of the final three locations um, the US 7 and 70th Avenue um, we were able to define funding uh, while this project was uh, happening with H the Highway Safety Improvement Program, H the funded. Um, second one, the Budsworth and 32nd Avenue, uh, with the segments of 32nd to 35th, was looking at uh, Dr. Cog uh, Transportation Improvement Program fund. At last one, Corridor, Mississippi, we're, we'll be the in County of Denver, that location. Um, last, uh, we just wanted to kind of mention, you know, the study, even though it was approach to benefit directly to top locations, at the same time, um, we were able to actually consider uh, other areas of the region. Also, look into this study um, to be more beneficial. Um, as far as the grant application, the map uh, that shows these studies, as far as the crash scores, um, the systemic risk scores uh, can be useful to identify a particular roadway of risk. Um, additionally, the list of top crashes of systemic risk on those that made it to the top list, um, there'd be a, another segment of projects that are listed to be uh, looked at to justify any improvements or even go after grants. Uh, with that, any comments, questions, concern, discussion that you can? Thank you. Any questions? Not seeing any. Thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. Now we'll move on to the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan 2024 Cycle Amendments. Attachment F, Alvin Badal Sanchez, please. Uh, transportation planning program management. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, is this an appropriate distance for everyone to hear me? No. All right. Cool. Um, so my item, uh, we wanted to provide an announcement for a process that we're going to be undertaking starting early next month and um, that will continue and hopefully wrap up in April of next year. Um, since we do have new staff, new folk on TAC, and it has been a bit since we've had a full cycle amendment process, we wanted to bring this item before you. With background, um, we do update our regional transportation plan every four years. I'm sure many of you all remember that. Um, but in between those four years, Dr. Cog's staff have historically provided an opportunity for project sponsors to make some targeted revisions to projects that are already in the regional. So uh, that would be table 3.1 and table 3.2 of our current RTP, if you're wondering what we're really looking at when we talk about cycle amendments. Our most recent regional transportation plan was adopted back in September of 2022. Um, that was a requirement to meet uh, the state's greenhouse gas emission reduction requirements for that October 1st deadline. And that itself actually followed about a two year long planning process to overhaul our 2040 RTP into our 2050 RTP. Even though this is just an amended RTP, we do still have to meet all of the different federal and state requirements that come with the regional transportation plan. So we'll, we will be looking at fiscal constraint, making sure we have enough funding over the next 20 to 30 years to actually implement these projects. Um, air quality, federal air quality conformity, and then our state greenhouse gas emission reduction requirements still do play a part in this amended RTP, so we will still be going through those full processes. Some information on what we're looking to undertake. We do anticipate the call for amendments opening September 5th, so next week, um, and then closing October 3rd. We would like everything submitted to staff by close of business on October 3rd. That gives project sponsors about a month to uh, work through all of our different application requirements. Uh, what we're looking for in the actual submittal packet is the amendment request form. So that completed, it is included in the TAC packet as a draft form. It will be available um, through a number of announcements that we make on our website uh, once the call officially opens. And then depending on what you're requesting, there might be some additional documentation that we're looking for. So additional forms, concurrence letters, coordination meeting with us, depending on what your amendment request is. 
And if it is a new project, we are requesting if you're able to provide a GIS shape file just so we can get that project into our own mapping. Um, some quick notes on who we're looking to submitting these applications, these amendment requests, uh, only public sector agencies. So think municipal, county governments, CDOT, RTD are actually able to submit amendments to projects that are already in the plan or what you're requesting to be in the plan. Only RTD can submit amendments to fast tracks projects. And if it's a toll project or a project with a tolling component and it's not uh, CDOT or HBCTIO related, um, only private toll, com toll companies can actually submit those. So think of revisions to projects on E470, Northwest Parkway, Jefferson Parkway. I'm looking at what we're actually looking for in these project-based amendments, these targeted revisions. There are typically three buckets that we're asking for. Do you want to add a new project to the regional transportation plan? Do you want to remove a project? Or what we most often see is you want to make a pretty big change to a project that's already in our regional transportation plan. And those typically include either a scope change, um, a cost or a funding change, or a completion year change. So maybe you're um, changing from type of widening you're looking at, you, want, you don't want a general purpose lane, you want a managed lane now, you're changing the transit service, you want to put down a particular corridor. Your cost could have doubled, you could be switching the type of funding that you're looking for, maybe you don't want to go for CDOT or Dr. Cog funding in the RTP, you think you could handle it with your own local funds. Or completion your changes, so you think the project will actually be completed sooner or later than we initially anticipated when we put the project in the regional transportation plan. Um, and then uh, for a more Detailed definition of what we mean by regionally significant projects, what we have to include in the Regional Transportation Plan. Appendix I includes our official definition for that, and it's linked in the electronic version of the packet to be able to find. Looking at the information that we're requesting, some basic information across all projects, what is the name, limits, the description, if there are particular forms that we're requiring for that type of project. For new projects, we're really looking for what is that going to cost, how are we going to fund that, um, where is the funding coming from? How do we know that it's available uh, and that there's a commitment from the project sponsor? And then a year of completion. So um, each of those will touch on those different pieces that we have to do through our regional transportation plan. So fiscal constraint, our federal air quality and conformity and state greenhouse gas requirements. And then because this is an amendment in between our major update, we do want some justification, some explanation around how the new project will be consistent with the priorities that we've identified in the adopted 2050 RTP, so just giving us some information to make some more informed decisions on what is appropriate to include at this point in cycle. For existing projects, um, we really just want to know what's changing. Is it that scope? Is it the cost or the funding? Or are you looking at a year and change? Um, and then it could also just be you're requesting the project removed from the regional transportation. For all of them, uh, just some justification, explanation. Why do you need that amendment now? Um, where are you in the project development process that you have to have this done by mid-2024? Um, why is this project important to your community, important to the region? How does it help us achieve the different priorities and goals we've established in the RTP and Metro Vision? An important consideration that I noted in the memo, um, this is the last opportunity staff are planning on providing project sponsors an opportunity to change, revise projects that are currently in the regional transportation plan. Uh, like I mentioned, we update it every four years. It actually can take about a year and a half to two years to actually get through that plan development process. So uh, after we close out the cycle amendment, we're already looking at starting the update to the next four-year regional transportation plan. So we're anticipating that adoption by 20, second half of 2026. So this is going to be the last opportunity that we're planning for any revisions to projects until we get into that full plan development process where we update data, update some of our priorities, um, go back to you all with project solicitations, go through um, all the different steps that go into a regional transportation plan. Next steps, like I mentioned, we'll be announcing the call for amendments on our website. We'll be sending on e-blasts. Uh, with the forms, the different links that are useful for you as you complete the different project amendment request forms. Uh, we've already started making announcements at sub-regional county forums as they've been occurring, so we'll continue to do that over the next month just to make sure that call gets put out there. We've also started coordinating with our external partners, CDOT, RTD, E470, the Air Pollution Control Division, and then following submittal, um, we'll reach back out to project sponsors if we have any further questions, explanation, justification. We'd like to just make a more informed decision during the cycle amendment process. And then uh, to wrap up, two quick slides, just looking at what we're looking at um, for the schedule. So September, that call for amendments, um, announcing, promoting at sub-regional forums, 
October through December is really where we're looking at modeling and coordination. Um, what follow-up do we need to do with y'all? Um, our modeling team getting through all the network coding, the different modeling they do, working with external partners. By January, we're wanting a final draft of the plan ready for public review. Um, and that includes all the different pieces that come with amending the regional transportation plan, not just the one document. It could be between three five different appendices that are also being impacted when we transportation plan. February to March, we build as the public and stakeholder review period. So that includes 30 days for the public, an official public hearing. We also um, give the Transportation Commission and the Air Pollution Control Division an opportunity to review our documents as well. And then we're aiming for uh, an April board adoption for that amended plan. And then following that, staff's going to go through all the different um, pieces we have to submit it to our federal partners, go through our own and design requirements to make sure our plan is accessible per state statute by next summer's deadline. And then closing out, just giving you an idea of what staff are already looking out over the next two to three. Like I mentioned, once the RTP cycle amendment process closes, um, by the second half of next year, we're already looking at kicking off the official update to our 2050 regional transportation plan that required four-year update. Um, just as with the amended plan, it still has to meet all of our different federal and state requirements, so including GHG, air quality, physical constraint. Um, if you'll recall, during the last major four-year update, we had a lot of um, different pieces involved in this. There was scenario planning. We had a whole project solicitation design with TAC to figure out what that process actually looked like. Actually looked like. We worked with our sub-regional forums to determine county-level priorities to solicit, review, include in the plan. So um, just a taste of what a typical major update looks like for us at Dr. Cog that will be starting at the end of the second half of 2024. And then at the same time, we'll also have two new TIP documents that are rolling through the pipeline at the same time. So the first one, fiscal years 2026 to 2029, no new calls for projects, just a reset at the two-year mark to align with some other schedules. And then 2028 to 2031 is where you can expect the regional and sub-regional calls for projects. So the process that you all are very familiar with after just completing four for the last two TIP. Concludes my presentation, Chair. Happy to take any questions. Any questions for Planner Sanchez? Alex. Alex Hatter, Boulder County. Um, so the RTP includes regionally significant projects and non regionally significant projects. Is Dr. Cog also soliciting uh, amendment requests for non regionally significant projects at this time? So if you do want to add a new project, um, that would fall into that. Um, we did this last cycle open up the type of projects that we do include in the regional transportation. So um, and submit it, and we'll see uh, how appropriate it is to include in RTP at appropriate for a four-year update when we reevaluate all the, the priorities that are made in the regional. Austin. Thanks, Alvin. Um, and I should know this, but the RTP is updated on a four-year cycle. Will it be the 2055 plan? Um, we have not determined that yet. Okay. Um, we are just by federal statute required to at least um, go out 20 years. So there is the possibility that we keep it at 2050 RTP. Um, and by the time of adoption, we're still, um, could we be within that? that 20 so that's um, something that staff will be having a discussion on um, for what does that actual four-year update look like next round. Other questions? Okay, thank you very much. Next item on the agenda was um, the multimodal project discretionary grant info forms. These are really something that we're supposed to read on our own. <laughs> so I'll turn it over to Ron in case you have anything to follow up about that, but be self explanatory. Yeah, just for, just for the committee's information, um, had three to submit um, uh, concepts for grant applications through the multimodal projects discretionary grant program. Remember, that's a combined call for projects from the feds for the mega program, the infra program, and a rural program. Um, if you have any questions about any of the information in the packet, I'd be happy to discuss that. Otherwise, the information is available for you in the packet. Thank you, Ron. Any questions for Ron? Seeing none, I'll turn it over to Carson. Uh, annual or the monthly update. Thanks, uh, Mr. Vice Chair. The Advanced Mobility Partnership Working Group uh, did meet earlier this month. We heard uh, a number of informational briefings. Dr. Cog staff uh, discussed their original BRT work, 
RTD went over the developments uh, with their partnership program that's ongoing. The city of Golden discussed their new free transit service connecting to regional transit in their area called the Ore Cart. Uh, and finally, the CEO Colorado Energy Office discussed their community accelerated mobility project camp opportunities. That's all I have, Mr. Vice Chair, thanks. Thank you. Um, right now I'll turn it over for, um, Jacob has an interactive uh, survey for us to take here. Based on our following up, our follow meetings, uh, most of the meetings that we have coming up, well, the November and December meetings, trying to figure out when is best. So get your phones out, start taking pictures of the screen above. <laughs> All right. Um, can you all hear me? Okay. Um, let's see if we can make this work. So uh, we're thinking ahead to the end of the year. And as um, those of you that have been on TAC a while know, our November and December meetings are often scheduled just a little bit differently because of holidays. And on some years, depending when those meetings are scheduled and what we have on our agendas, we either maybe cancel one of those or we combine them, et cetera. So we just wanted to get the pulse of you all um, now to start thinking ahead of um, scheduling those meetings for November and December. So we're going to attempt to do this through a Menti poll. Um, I think most of you have done this by now, but you can either go to menti.com as you see, um, or you can uh, scan the QR code and then enter the number that you see here to get to the specific Menti that we'll, that we'll use to do that. I'll give you a second to do that. All right, so good, people are already starting to vote. So as you see, the first question, once you get in, hopefully you all can get in and see this, the first question should be, would you prefer to keep the two existing TAC meetings at the end of the year, meaning the one that we already have scheduled on November 27th, that's the Monday after Thanksgiving, and December 18th, which is obviously um, the third week instead of the fourth week, because the fourth, the regular meeting day would actually be on Christmas day. So right now we have those meetings on November 27th and December 18th. Do you want to keep those existing meetings or combine them? So that's the first question. A lot of votes for combining. I'm a little disappointed that no one wants to keep Yeah, no one wants to keep them both. It hurts me a little bit. <laughs> All right, I'll give you one more, uh, a couple more seconds to fill that out. <clears throat> All right, one person, thank you. One person. <laughs> All right. If we combine the two meetings, which date do you prefer? And I should say here, by the way, in terms of the dates, um, we're looking, so if we combine the meetings, we would do probably in early to mid-December. So the dates you see reflected here, Monday, December 4th at 1.30 or December 11th, uh, Monday, December 11th at 1.30. So we're asking if you prefer one or the other or if you don't have a preference. more seconds. Right. And I think that was it. So thank you for that feedback. We will use that as we kind of schedule ahead on the calendar. Really appreciate it. Great. Thank you, Jacob. Um, Ron, did you have anything for other, matter, other matters? Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just wanted to circle back with the committee since last month, the TAC recommended approval of the 2024 through 2027 TIP. Happy to report back that the Regional Transportation Committee and the board both unanimously approved the TIP. So we are working through the administrative details to get that approval through the Federal Highway Administration and FTA partners, as well as the EPA on the air quality conformity determination, um, and encourage everyone that especially has projects that are uh, have funding allocated in the early years of the TIP, start thinking about your grant agreement process with CDOT, get rolling as quickly as you can. Um, a lot more work on the part of uh, staff Todd, Josh, and Brad will be pestering everyone uh, to help keep projects on track. And then I'd be remiss if I didn't take this chance while I've got the floor, Mr. Chair, to express, again, my gratitude to 
Todd and Jeff and the team at Dr. Cog for managing through a very complex tip process, but even more so to all of you and your agencies and your staffs for working with us through what was a very complex and time-consuming process. We certainly recognize uh, the asks that we had of all of you because of some of the complications of the IAJA and the bill and the greenhouse gas standard uh, kind of kind of made us sort of go back and reflect on and, and change sort of our standard process. So our, our thanks to all of you for your partnership and your work through that process. Thank you, staff. Just a reminder, our next meeting is September 20th. So hope to see you all there. If you did not sign in, please sign in at the table or with Cam. And uh, thank you for participation today. We are adjourned at 3.20. Thank you.